Luke 24, 36 to 49. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Joel. Good morning again. Um, I guess it was late last year that our elders and their wives got together and had a lengthy uh, discussion and uh, sp spent a lot of time praying and thinking through this, but we kind of came up with what we wanted to do was take a season in the life of our church and go back to some fundamentals and ask ourselves the question, who are we as a church and what do we want to be as a church? What kind of church do we want to be? And so that's what we're going to do this fall. We're going to take a number of weeks throughout the fall season, leading us up until Advent, to try to answer that question, who do we want to be as a church? Now, you might be thinking, okay, why in the world take an entire season to answer that question? Why is that so important? And here's why. Because it's really easy for churches to forget who they are and why they exist. It's just easy for churches for some reason to do. And when that happens, when we forget who we are and why we exist, then we become a group of people that get together uh, once a week, we drink some coffee, and we listen to some songs, hear a little teaching, and the rest of the city could care less that we're here. And when that happens, we have, we have lost touch with uh, what God wants his church to be. And so really what we're doing this fall is trying to answer that question, what is God's vision for his church? Not what is Matt's vision for this church, what is the staff's vision for this church, or what is anyone's, one person's vision for this church, but what is God's vision for his church in the world? What, what does that look like? And, and I think this is really important for, a, a, for lots of different reasons, but um, one is there's just a lot of new faces. Some of y'all are brand new. Maybe you've just, you're checking us out for the first time, or you've been watching us online and decided to show up, or whatever. I know there's a, there's a lot of people that are exploring faith in Jesus and what that could even look like. Uh, and, and, so, and so maybe you're here and you're asking the question, okay, what is, what is this church about? As I'm checking out this new church, I don't know any of these people, I don't know any of this stuff, what, what is Redeemer about? And some of you may have been here from the beginning. Some of you are just OG Redeemerites, been here since 06 when this church was planted. And I think as we kind of go back and think through what, what, what is, why was Redeemer planted in the way that it was, hopefully this will also be a season for you to kind of be reinvigorated on why Redeemer exists and maybe think through new and creative ways on how you can hook into what we are doing. So I think the season for the life of our church will be really important as we kind of think through together, who are we and who do we want to be? And to set up this passage that was just read for us, um, I want you to think about this article that was written. It was in ESPN. This is back in 2017 when Steve Kerr um, you know, became as a coach to the Golden State Warriors, and he was having this conversation with the general manager, Bob Myers. And here's what, here's what Steve Kerr says. He says... You know, when he came in, he completely transformed the way that the team operated. And here's, and here's how he put it. He said, in order for us to do this, meaning 
do things differently. In order for us to do this, we have to transition from an offense that is heavy isolation. Now, what he means is, in basketball terminology, what he's talking about is our, our offensive strategy can't just be we got to give our superstar the ball every time, and he's got to score all of our points. We need to get everybody involved. A lot, we're moving away from isolation to movement. And here's what he says. The change is going to be dramatic. There is a makeup in every player who's ever played that if you get to touch the ball and you get to be a part of the action, whether as an assist man, a ball mover, a shooter, or a dribbler, the more people involved in the offense, the more powerful it becomes. And Bob Myers uh, responds with this. He says, everybody wants to be a part of something. Everybody wants to be a part of something. I think that's profound because they're, they're, what they are tapping into is not just true of basketball players. They are tapping into something that is true of human beings, of all of us. We all want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. I mean, just think about it. Why is it that you can be wildly successful and accomplished, and many of you are, where, you, where you, you, you're at the point in your career that you want to be, you've got the money, you've got the toys, you've got the house, you've got it in the neighborhood that you want, you can do the vacation wherever you want, and yet you're still bored, still apathetic towards life. It's not because those are bad things, those are great things. It's just that they're too small. They're not, they're not big enough. We want to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves, that gives us purpose, that gives us energy. In fact, that's what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is that your individual little story gets swept up into this bigger story that gives you purpose, gives you hope, gives you spiritual resources to navigate the complexity of life, gives you resilience throughout of all, all of the crazy and difficult things that life throws at you. That's what it means in many ways to be a Christian. So what I want to do this morning is, is try to answer two questions. What is that story? What is the Christian story that we're invited to get swept up into? And why does it matter? Especially for our church. What is the story, and then why does it matter for us as people, and especially for us as a church? So let's look at those one at a time. What is, what is the story? To do that, I want to look at this little episode that was read. There's so much going on in this passage. We're really only going to do a, just a 30,000-foot kind of flyover. But I, what I want you to see is, is what Jesus is doing in this passage. What he is doing is he's connecting him and us to a bigger story. You know, if you read through the Bible, you read through the Gospels, you can extract little one-liners that Jesus throws out, little tweetable, little truth bombs that Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged, turn the other cheek. You know, all these little, just fun little tweetable little nuggets. But if that's all, you're, if that's all we understand about Jesus, is he just says these little cute little proverbs that are helpful, you miss the point that all of those little things are flowing from this bigger thing that Jesus is doing. And I want to, that's what I want to show you. For, let me just show you through this. This episode takes place, it's right after the, the resurrection, where Jesus appears bodily, raised from the dead to his disciples. They're very freaked out by this, as you can see in the reaction in verse 37. He calms them down, and then here's what he says in verse 44. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, when he says the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, this is just a normal shorthand way of referring to the Hebrew scriptures, what you and I might call the Old Testament, which is the story of the world. And did you notice what Jesus just said? It's all written about me. I'm telling you everything in it that is fulfilled in me, which is Jesus' way of saying, I am the central figure of human history. It's a crazy big thing to say. But let's keep going. Look what he says next, verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. In other words, 
It's not just that the whole point of human history, the whole story is about me, but it all crescendos in my life, in my death, in my resurrection. The whole story of the world is leading up to this moment, this point. He's situating himself in this massive, bigger story, but the story doesn't end. He pivots to where the story is leading. Look at verse 47. He says, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. In other words, the story is going to continue. And the way that it's going to continue is by you, he's talking to his disciples, you are witnesses that are going to go out and proclaim to all nations the reality that there is forgiveness of sins possible in me. So you take all that in. Here's what Jesus just did. The whole point of human history is leading up to my death and resurrection. And the whole point of history moving forward is a continuation of that. The whole story is about me, and he's looking at his disciples, and he's he's looking at us and saying, and you have a role to play in this bigger story. You have have something, you you have a part to play in this bigger drama. You know, this is in many ways what Hagrid did to Harry Potter in book one. You know, Harry Potter was just this normal kid. He was living under the uh, stairs at his aunt and uncle's house. He had a weird scar on his face, but he was just like, he's just a dude, just a normal kid. And then this half giant shows up and invites him to understand his life in light of this bigger story that he had no idea about, a story that involves wizards, a story that involves Quidditch and hippogriffs. And Harry doesn't understand any of that stuff, but when he starts to get swept up into this bigger story, he realizes he's a part of something bigger than himself. That's what it means to be a Christian. We begin, we we just function like normal, ordinary people until one day the lights get turned on and we realize, whoa, we are a part of this bigger thing that's going on in the universe. Now, Jesus doesn't give you all the details of what the story is, but if you zoom out and you look at the Bible as a whole, the Bible gives you the whole story in really four big chapters. And four chapters are this. Chapter one, creation. God makes everything, and he makes it all good and beautiful and glorious. And then chapter two hits, and humanity rebels against God as their king, and as a result, kind of throws everything into a state of sin and misery, and everything gets broken and jacked up and twisted about our world, the fall. Then chapter three comes, and Jesus inaugurates his kingdom, This is called chapter 3, Redemption. Jesus shows up and inaugurates his kingdom by paying the penalty of our sins on the cross, then rising to new life to, to heal and fix everything that's broken in the world. And the way that you access that is through faith. And then chapter four, one day, someday, there's this new creation where God's gonna restore and redeem everything to its fullness, where His people will truly be restored to him and to ourselves and to each other and to the rest of the world. It's all going to be glorious. Now, that is the story that we inhabit as Christians. That is the story. You woke up this morning in a city that was created good. It's fallen into sin and it's broken and it's twisted. Jesus is redeeming it and will one day, someday, make it glorious and restored. Now, you hear all of that, and you think, wow, this feels very abstract and very esoteric. Or you may hear that, and you think, or this is, just, this is so overly familiar. I've heard this like a million times. Who cares? And that's a great question. Who cares? Why does that matter? If that is the Christian story, that leads to our second question. Why does it matter? Why does that matter for you? Why does that matter for me? Why does that matter for us? And, and really, this is where we could take the rest of the decade and flesh out the implications of what that would mean and why that matters for us. But for, just for the sake of time, I'll just do two so we are not here for a decade. Let's just do two, two ways that that might matter for you and for me and for us. Here's the first way that that story matters is that it gives us purpose, That story gives us purpose. 
There's a, there's a famous anecdote I've heard. I don't know if this is true or not, but in 1963, President John F. Kennedy was really pushing the country in tor uh, towards space exploration and really kind of challenging us to put a man on the moon. And so the story goes, he went and he visited the NASA space headquarters and he's getting a tour and he's walking around and people are pointing out, oh, this is, you know, this is this and this is that. And as they're walking through one of the hallways, they pass by a man with a broom who's just kind of sweeping the floor and the president is kind and he engages this man and talks to him and says, oh, like, who are you? Like, who are you? What, like, what are you doing? What do you do here? And the man says, Mr. President, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Whether or not that story is true, I don't know. But the point is, here's this guy who sweeping floors, and yet in his mind, he has connected this little act that I'm doing right here to this bigger mission, putting somebody on the moon. And that's what it means to be a Christian. What it means to be a Christian is that you begin to see your little corner of the kingdom, your little world, all the, the small little ways that you live your life as a part of this bigger thing that you are a part of. It's a part of this, this bigger story of God making all things new in Jesus. If you don't have the bigger story in mind, in fact, think about it like this. You know, modern evangelicalism has really emphasized in the past 50 years or so that Jesus has come to save you, to, to forgive you of your sins and to, and to whisk your soul away to heaven. And that is glorious and it's true and it's wonderful. The only problem with that is it's not the full story. That's a truncated understanding of what the gospel actually is. In fact, if that's all Jesus came to do was just save you from your sins, it's hard to, I think it's hard to connect the dots why I should be compelled to care about social concerns? Why should I care about the needs of my city because Jesus saved me of my sins? It's a big intellectual leap to get from point A to point B. If Jesus saved me from my sins, how does that help me think about poverty? How does that help me think about racial injustice? And in fact, if that's all Jesus came to do, just to save you and whisk you away to heaven, then what that means is it makes serving the needs of the city feel like a chore. It's just something that you do every now and, the, and now and then. It's like, okay, I'll go and I'll volunteer at the soup kitchen and or I'll, I'll, I'll write a check, which is how most Christians typically think about how to care for the needs around them. I'll go volunteer or I'll go write a check. Both amazing, both great, both more than a lot of people are doing, and yet that can make it feel like it's a chore. You know, it's, like, it's like, kind of like eating broccoli for some of us, where it feels like, I know it's good for me. I feel better after I eat it, but I don't really want to eat it. I'd rather have ice cream. And so it just feels like, oh, here's this, it's this thing I, I know I should do. I, I want to be a good person. I want to be a good Christian. I want to go do these things, but it just feels like a chore. It feels like this add-on because it's disconnected from this bigger story. But when you see yourself as a part of this, this bigger thing that God is doing, making all things new in Jesus, you begin to see yourself as an actor in this divine drama that is playing out around you and in you 24-7. That totally transforms how you think about everything. That changes the way that you think about how you spend your money, that changes the way that you think about where you're gonna live in the city, that changes the way you think about where you're going to send your kids to school in the city if you have them. This changes the way you think about what to do with your body. Every component of your life now gets filtered through this grid. How you live your entire life now gets taken up with this bigger story, the gospel of the kingdom. In fact, I, I, I want to read you this quote. I've, I've read this to you uh, before, but a lot of you haven't heard it. So we'll read it again. John Ortberg, it's, by the way, it's at the beginning of your bulletin. This is from his book, All the Places to Go. And there is a, there's a typo, a, a mistake in there. It's my fault. I'll point it out. But I want to read this to you because it's, I think it's an amazing quote, and it's super helpful. But he writes this. Christians should always be asking one another, what's your problem? What's your problem? And then these are my words. I just included it in the quote on accident. What he means by that is, do you have a problem that you are trying to fix in the world that is worthy of your best energies? 
And then this is him again. He says, quote, tell me what your problem is and I'll tell you who you are. People with small souls have small problems. Small problems like how to make their life safer, more convenient, how to put an irritating neighbor in his or her place, how to make wrinkles less visible, how to cope with cranky coworkers or lack of recognition. But people who live with largeness of soul are occupied by large problems. Large problems like how to end poverty, how to stop sex trafficking, how to help at-risk children receive a great education, how to bring beauty and art to a city. You need a God-sized problem. If you don't have one, your current problem is you don't have a problem. Because when God calls people, he calls them to face a problem. The standard word for the condition of being truly problem-free is dead. Now, that's an intense quote, I know, but you hear what he's saying. He's saying when you get swept up into this bigger thing that God is doing, you get pulled out of yourself. Your concerns your issues, the details of your life, they do matter. They are important. For most of us, we just get so consumed and obsessed with our little individual problems, we can't think outside of ourselves. And so we just kind of live life like everybody else. But what the gospel does, when you get swept up into this bigger story, it pulls you outside of yourself so that you can start to think about, see, and take on the bigger problems around you. We want Redeemer to be a church that takes on big problems in Midtown and in our city at large and in the world. Now, you think that is an aud- that's an audacious thing to think about. This little group of people, we're going to take on the problems of the world? Yeah. Because what God tends to do is he uses unqualified, inconsequential people like us to do big, crazy, amazing things. That story gives you purpose. It gives you purpose. When you begin to live your life as an actor in this divine cosmic play, that gives you incredible purpose, a, a, a life that is now worth living, a life worth giving everything away in order to live it. It gives you purpose. And here's the second thing. This story doesn't just give you purpose, it also gives you freedom. It gives you freedom. Most people might think, you might think this too, that a perfect game of bowling is to get a score 300, 12 consecutive strikes. And that's an amazing feat, but what professional bowlers will tell you is that that's not really the holy grail that they're going after. The the real thing is not a perfect game, but a perfect series. Because a perfect series is three consecutive perfect games, which is 36 consecutive strikes over and over and over. There's only been 36 people that have ever been, that have ever done it ever since they started officially counting. Uh, I I was reading this article about this that in, in, uh, I think it was January of 2010, a guy named Bill Fong shows up at a bowling alley with his bowling team in a bowling league on a Monday night, just like, he goes there every single week. This is in Plano, Texas, just north of where I grew up in Dallas. And he shows up, and it's his turn to bowl. And he stands up, cranks out a strike. Awesome way to start. Gets up again when it's his turn, strike. Bam, oh, he's on a roll. Strike, 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 strike. Finishes the the first game, perfect, 12 strikes in a row. His teammates are like, that's amazing, high-fiving him, unbelievable. Second game, he gets up, and he is in the zone, and he is just strike, 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 just, he's just crushing it. He finishes the second game, perfect. His his teammates are, are blown away. They've never seen anything like this before, unbelievable. By the time he gets up for his third game, the article says, it says he felt like he was floating. He, he's just on another planet at this point, just cranking him out. Strike, strike, strike. By the time it gets to the fifth frame, it says he feels numb. Strike. Sixth frame, there's this crowd of people that have now gathered around him. 
Cell phones are out. Everybody's filming this. Facebook is exploding online. It, there's, anytime it gets a strike now, the, cl- the crowd is erupting in applause. Like, this has become a thing. This has become a moment. He is sweating profusely. He's, he's starting to get dizzy. He gets up there, strike, strike. He goes up to the final one, 36th time he's up. He wipes off the ball. You can see this is all, you know, it's filmed on a phone. You can find it on YouTube. And he gets up there, takes five steps, lets it rip. It cuts out, swings back, pins explode. The 10th pin on the farthest one from the right wobbles and stays up. And everyone watching just just is devastated. They can't even believe what they just saw. Nobody can breathe. The dude, Bill Fong, says that the room was spinning. He sits down. His, his friends try to, you know, cheer him up. They, they buy him some drinks. He's not really interested. He goes home after about 30 minutes, vomits in the toilet, feels sick. The room is still spinning, calls the paramedics. He gets taken to the ER. He's having a stroke. A stroke that, that if he hadn't called, literally was going to kill him. So much pressure, so much stress from that moment that it was, it was literally killing him. In fact, looking back on it, the article said that all of the sweat, all of the dizziness from his third game showed you that he was having a stroke during most of the last kind of third match, which is even crazy that he was performing at that level. Anyway, what was so crazy about this story is there was, there was so much writing on it, so much pressure, so everyone was watching, all the cell phones were out, everything was on the line, there was no room for error. Now, I don't know if you've ever lived with that degree of pressure before, but that is not what it feels like to live in the Christian story. To live in the Christian story means that the pressure is off. Because at the center of the Christian story is grace. That's why in verse 47, the thing that is being proclaimed is the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus. If that's true, that means we have freedom to fail. If it is true that Jesus came and he bore the brunt of what you and I deserved that he took up all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our struggles on the cross with him, and he got obliterated for us so that we would get what Jesus deserves. All of the honor, all of the glory, all of the blessing that was due to him now gets due to us. That means his grace covers all of our sin. His grace covers everything that we've ever done wrong. It's covering everything that we're currently doing this moment. It's going to cover everything we'll ever do until we die. It's all covered, which means the pressure is off. We have freedom in unbelievable, radical new ways now. Freedom to live into the reality of the story by starting to take risks. Because if we screw up, if we wake up the next morning, there's egg on our face, guess what? It's okay. It's not the end of the world. Jesus has paid for it. When you connect the grace of the gospel with the bigger story of the gospel, that frees you to start taking risks in bigger and more sacrificial ways. You start thinking through, how can I give my money away more sacrificially? It's going to feel like a risk. It's going to cut into me in different ways, but it's okay. How can I talk about Jesus maybe with my friends, my coworkers, my my neighbors? Take risks in ways that I never thought that I would before, but it's okay. I screw it up. I'll just apologize. We'll make things right. We'll deal with it. Jesus makes it okay. The pressure is off. If at the center of our story is a story of grace and a story of purpose, put those together, that makes us radically different people. So who do we want to be as a church? We want to be a storied church. We want to be a group of people that know the gospel of the kingdom. Because what that does is it gives us incredible purpose to take on big problems, the big problems of our city, the big problems of our world, and it gives us an inner sense of liberty because it's a story of grace. That's what we want to be. We want to be a church that is storied. Invite you to be a part of it with us. Let me pray. 
Father, help us to help us to expand our imagination to see and to know ourselves as being a part of this bigger thing that you're doing in the world. And I pray that you would help us connect the dots where, where we are living these individualistic, small, private lives. Help us to connect the dots and see that we are also swept up into this bigger thing that you're doing, making all things new in Jesus. And would that change us? Would that help us to be radically different people? people that care about the needs around us, but care about it with a sense, not a sense of we're the saviors, we're the messiahs. Help us to know that we are just but needy people in need of grace, and in your kindness, you've given it to us. We pray all this in the name of our hero, the Lord Jesus. Amen.